I'm tremendously honored to be here. I'm tremendously honored to be part of this. I'm a huge admirer of what Ackerman does, and as I'll explain in a minute, I'm hoping to look even more deeply <coughs> at some of the questions Ackerman addresses. Um, but I'll begin by talking about some of the themes of um, uh, Far From the Tree. Even in purely non-religious terms, homosexuality represents a misuse of the sexual faculty. It is a pathetic little second-rate substitute for reality, a pitiable flight from life. As such, it deserves no glamorization, no rationalization, and above all, no pretense that it is anything but a pernicious sickness. That's Time Magazine in 1966, when I was three years old. And in the last 18 months, as you all know, the President of the United States and the Supreme Court have expressed support for gay marriage. And I set out to write my book determined to understand how we got from there to here. <clears throat> how something <clears throat> that was universally understood to be an illness and a crime came instead to be an identity and what the changes were that had to take place for that to happen. When I was perhaps six years old, I was at a shoe store that some of you who grew up in this town may remember, um, infelicitously called Indian Walk Shoes um, on Madison Avenue. Yes, yes, happy memories. And at the, <laughs> at the end of getting um, my shoes fitted, our shoes fitted, my brother and I were told by the salesman there that each of us could have a balloon to take home. And my brother wanted a red balloon, and I wanted a pink balloon. And my mother said that she thought I'd really rather have a blue balloon. And I said, no, no, I really wanted the pink balloon. And she reminded me that my favorite color was blue. The fact that my favorite color now is blue, but I'm still gay, will give you some evidence of a mother's influence and its limits. <laughs> it's a topic, I think, dear to the hearts of many who are part of Ackerman. So I grew up in this world in which I sort of um, struggled to understand my, um, my identity and tried, struggled to understand who I was in a family that was essentially very loving and supportive, but not necessarily always completely at ease with who I was. And I remember as I was growing up how my mother would say over and over again, the love for your children is like no other feeling in the world. And until you have children, you don't know what it feels like. And as a small child, I was so moved by that. It meant that being mother to my brother and me was the great joy of her life. And as an adolescent, I took it somehow personally and thought, well, but I'm not really on that path. I think I might be gay. And it made me anxious when she said it. And when I came out and she went on saying it, sometimes it made me very angry. I said, you know that's not the path I'm on, and I want you to stop saying it. But she never did. And I think it came to define the way I understood family in ways that have resonated ever since. In 1994, my editors at the Times Magazine asked me to write an article about deaf culture. And I went into the deaf world of which I had known absolutely nothing. And I went to deaf clubs, and I went to deaf theater, and I went to the Miss Deaf America contest in Nashville, Tennessee, where people complained about the slurry Southern signing. <laughs> and I immersed myself I immersed myself very deeply in that world, and I came to see that deafness is a culture, that it's a very beautiful culture. And then I found out that most deaf children are born to hearing parents, that those hearing parents in general have tended to say to those children that they should do their best to function in the hearing world, often with a strong focus historically before the cochlear implant on lip reading and oral speech, and that many of those children discover deaf culture in adolescence or thereafter when it comes as a great liberation to them. And I thought how similar that is to the question of gay people who are born to straight parents, who often have thought that they would have an easier life if they were in the mainstream and didn't have a marginalizing difference. And how often those gay people have ended up coming to a sense of identity in adolescence or thereafter. And then a friend of a friend of mine had a daughter who was a dwarf 
And she began talking about some of these same questions. She said, do I tell her she's just like everyone else but short? Or do I get involved with the little people of America and try to foster an awareness of dwarf politics and some kind of dwarf identity? And as she narrated that bewilderment, I thought, here it is again, a family that perceives itself to be in some sense normal with a child who is in some sense exceptional or abnormal, having to make the leap to understand who their child is. And so I formulated the idea that there are really two kinds of identities. There are vertical identities passed down generationally from parent to child, one's ethnicity, one's nationality, usually one's language, frequently one's religion. And then there are what I called horizontal identities. Horizontal because they're learned not from previous generations in your family, but from a peer group. So being gay, being deaf, being autistic, being a dwarf, many of the other categories that um, Lois listed earlier on in introducing me. And as I looked at that reality and saw the journeys that these families had to take in order to come to terms with these children who weren't what they were banking on when they decided to have children, I came away with the sense that there was a difference that I had never before understood between love and acceptance. And I thought to myself how I had thought that when my parents had their period of difficulty with the idea that I was gay, it seemed to me like a lack of love. And I suddenly saw that it wasn't a lack of love. It was only that acceptance takes time. And I think that while all of us, especially those of us in this room, have encountered stories of terrible abuse and neglect, my perception is that most people love their children and that most people have to go through a long process to accept their children. And it's that process that the kind of family therapy practiced at Ackerman um, and practiced elsewhere is so incredibly helpful in achieving. And while I think acceptance should always be the goal of love, I think confusing the two of them and assuming that they're one and the same has led to a great many people experiencing a great deal of pain that they didn't really need to experience. And so I think there's a heroism in all of the family therapy work that helps people along that path to acceptance. I don't have time to tell you the stories of very many of the people in the book. I'll tell you one, which is the story of Clinton Brown, who was the dwarf you saw in the video. Um, when he was born with diastrophic dwarfism, his parents were told, as he said, that he would never really walk or talk. And his mother was actually counseled to leave him in the hospital because he wouldn't live long and he could die there quietly. And she said, no, I'm not going to do that. She said, I'm going to take my baby home. And if everything goes that way, at least I'll know I tried my best. And so she took Clinton home with her. And despite not having um, significant educational or economic resources, she found her way to the best doctor for the treatment of people with the particular kind of dysplasia that he had. Um, she uh, enrolled him in a protocol at Johns Hopkins in which he ended up having, as he said, 30 major surgical procedures across his childhood, many of them because they were spinal surgeries involving being immobilized for periods of six weeks at a time. And while he was stuck in that hospital, he thought, well, there's nothing else much to do, so since they're sending around these tutors, I might as well focus on my schoolwork. And he ended up achieving in school on a level that had been previously unimaginable in his family and was in the end the first person in his family to go to college. And he went to college not very far from where his parents lived, and he lived on campus and was a member of a fraternity and had a specially fitted car that he was able to drive. And one day I got a call from his mother and she said, I was driving home from shopping today and I went past a bar and there was Clinton's car parked outside a bar. <laughs> she said, I thought to myself, they're six feet tall, he's three feet tall, two beers for them is four beers for him. She said, I wanted to go in there and interrupt, but I knew I couldn't do that. So I drove home and left him 11 messages on his voicemail. <laughs> she said, and then I thought, if someone had told me just after he was born that my future worry would be that he would go drinking and driving with his college buddies, <laughs> I'd have been so thrilled to have that problem. And I said, what do you think you did? What do you think you did that allowed this child for whom there was such a dire and bleak prognosis to emerge as someone who is accomplished 
and successful and popular and happy and funny. And she said, what did we do? We loved him, that's all. Clinton just always had that light in him. And we were fortunate enough to be the first to see it there. It was an extraordinary progress she had made. As Clinton indicated in the video, she had initially considered leaving him behind at the hospital. She didn't see him the first few days of his life. Family counseling and family therapy, I think, is often not about making people who don't feel any love feel that love, but about liberating it and allowing people to express it. And in my study of all of these people with all of these different horizontal identities, I found that if you think of each of these conditions as relating only to itself, you're talking about small, siloed factions of human experience. There are only so many people with schizophrenia. There are only so many people who are transgender. There are only so many people who commit crimes um, who, or who are prodigies. But if you allow for the idea that every family has to negotiate the fact of difference within their family, that all of these families in dealing with children who are surprising and different have something in common, and indeed have something in common with all the families for whom the difference doesn't have so clear a name, but is nonetheless the surprise that your children are never the people you imagine before you have them. Then we see that this is part of the common human experience. And what I found in the interactions I had with these families was that that common human experience was very liberating for them when they stopped thinking that they were the only ones like this, when they stopped thinking there was no one on television who looked like them. And that, I think, is to me much of what family therapy is about, much of what Ackerman is about, much of why I'm so glad to be here today. It's about allowing people to understand those commonalities and liberating them to actually act on the love that they most often actually feel somewhere deep at some level. Um, I decided to have children while I was working on this book. And there were quite a few people who said to me, how can you be deciding to have children in the middle of a book about everything that can go wrong? <laughs> and I had to say over and over, but it's not a book about everything that can go wrong. It's a book about how much joy there can be in the experience of being a parent, even when everything appears to be going wrong. And rather than turning me away from parenthood, it turned me toward it. So I'll explain my family in the most truncated possible form. My husband is the biological father of two children with some lesbian friends in Minneapolis. Um, one of my best friends from college had got divorced but wanted to have a child, and so we have a daughter who lives with her mother in Texas. And then my husband and I wanted the experience of bringing up a child together full time. And so we have a son of whom I'm the biological father. We had an egg donor and our surrogate was Laura, the lesbian mother of his two biological children. <laughs> so five parents of four children in three states. And there seem to be people who think that the existence of families such as ours somehow undermines families such as theirs. And I don't accept those subtractive models of love, only additive ones. And I truly believe that in the same way that we need species diversity to keep the planet going, we need this diversity of affection and family to sustain the ecosphere of kindness. And it has become a mission for me to try to help find um, these liberating experiences for other people. And what's odd is that once the children came, the ways that we had them came to feel in many ways so secondary and so irrelevant because the fact of being parents takes over in such an extraordinary way. And I've often found myself thinking, the love for your children is unlike any other feeling in the world. And until you have children, you don't know what it feels like. Thank you. I'm going to say a few words about um, the book that I have just started writing, which is to say I've just sold the idea and need to start researching and writing it. Um, <laughs> because I think it's, it's relevant and because I think some of you in the room will probably have good ideas for me. Um, but I'm trying to write a book in which I look at the idea that in an era in which women are likely to work and men are likely to be more involved in childcare than their fathers were, 
that our ideas of motherhood and fatherhood are in some small measure at least beginning to merge toward an idea of parenthood and to look at how that's both reflected in and occasioned by changed attitudes towards divorce, single parents by choice or indeed not by choice, um, open adoptions, gay families, increased foster care and all of the other new structures um, of the family. And I think as family therapists, so many of you in this room are family therapists or are very supportive of people who are family therapists. And you can imagine, having heard the structure of my family, that family therapists are highly relevant to um, <laughs> our day-to-day -day life. But I think as many of you um, are in those roles, that it's the most exciting thing to me that has happened um, in a long time, that we're beginning to reimagine what constitutes family, the life that my husband who's here tonight and I have together would have been completely unimaginable back when that Time Magazine article ran or when I wanted the pink balloon and Indian Dean walk shoes. But whenever you have radical transformation, no matter how positive it is, it comes with new challenges and new difficulties and new low side of confusion. And so I'm hoping that in investigating those things, I'll be able to see how some of it works and what the process is through which all of us can strengthen both the complexity and the depth of family. Thank you very, very much for this honor. Thank you. Thank you.